It's Pentecost Sunday, and I'm Pastor Matt, and I'm so glad that you are here to worship the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Today we will learn about Pentecost and what it means for our lives. We'll confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed, and we'll confess that we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. We'll also hear scripture read and a message applied to our lives. We'll confess our sins and receive the forgiveness of God. And we'll receive a blessing at the end. We'll sing praises to our awesome God and we'll pray together. I pray that during this quarantine you'll be lifted up, that your faith will be fueled by the Holy Spirit, and that you will trust in God during these uncertain times. I want to share with you a few announcements. First off, we have curriculum for kids. So parents, I invite you to visit our website, lolchurch.net forward slash kids. There you can find curriculum that applies to your children's lives and teaches them about Pentecost and the Holy Spirit. You'll find coloring sheets and activity pages and even a video that teaches them about the faith. Also, we've had more requests than ever for emergency assistance. And if you need assistance of any kind, whether it's paying a bill or paying rent or paying for some utility or your cell phone bill, please do fill out this form online. We would love to help you the best way that we can. Also, we would love to pray for you specifically according to your needs. So please visit our website, click on prayer request, fill out the form, and we will pray for you specifically. And it's a great time to give to the Lord who's given you and me faith to believe in Jesus and to know that he loves us. And I encourage you to test your faith by giving back to God a portion of what he's first given to you. During Pentecost, it was a time for the people of God to come together and give thanks for the first fruits of the harvest. So we gather together. While we're not gathering physically, we gather together watching this service and we give to the Lord the first fruits of what he's given to us. So I invite you to give online by visiting our website lolchurch.net then click on give in the upper right hand corner and you can give a gift to the church also you can mail your gift to the church p.o box 251 wasco illinois 60183 and you can give by text text the word give to this number 630-381-1199 and you'll be prompted to give a gift to the lord I got a haircut for the first time in months. I think it's been four months, and I saw this picture when your human is a hairstylist in quarantine, and it made me laugh. It's important that we keep times like this light at least a little bit because they're so heavy, aren't they? So I hope that today you'll be lifted up in your faith and that you will receive the joy of the Lord, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is joy. And may the Lord fill you with joy as you worship him. Let's sing to our awesome God who loves us. Your hands are 
as all your nations shout to God all the nations how awesome is the Lord most high we will praise you together for now and forever how awesome is the Lord most high Please join me in prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that gives us faith to trust in you, the Lord and giver of life. We thank you so much for fueling our faith during this pandemic to know that you will use this for good, that you are active and that you are using your church and that the church has left the building during this quarantine and we are your church wherever we are, in our homes, wherever we are, Lord, you use us for your good because of the Holy Spirit. We pray that the words we speak and the things that we do would glorify you and that we would walk in step with the Spirit. So, Lord, we pray that you would convict us of our sin and lead us to the cross, lead us to the empty tomb, and lead us to repent and to receive the good news of Jesus Christ, that we are saved by grace through faith. And this is not a gift of our own, but it is a gift from you. Lord, as we worship you today, we pray that you would teach us what Pentecost means for our lives. And as we confess our faith now, using the words of the Nicene Creed, may we know you, the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's confess our Christian faith using the ancient words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We now hear the word of the Lord. The first scripture reading comes from Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. 
Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will turn, be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. John 16, five through 16, the work of the Holy Spirit. Now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while you will see me no more and then after a little while you will see me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and for your Holy Spirit, our counselor, who encourages us and empowers us to live for Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My name is Brian Zilke, and I'm the director of discipleship here at Lord of Life Church. Today we're going to look at Acts chapter 2, the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost what it meant for the believers then, and what it means for us today. I've been thinking about it in light of what's been going on in my life lately. Last week was an emotional week for me. I went up north to my favorite place to vacation with my family, a place I've been going every summer my whole life. My parents owned two cabins on a small lake in northern Wisconsin. My grandpa bought them around 1966, so my dad has been going up since then. My mom's been going for a while too. She was first invited up with her best friend who happened to be my dad's cousin. Years later, they went on their first date. Not up there, but there's still a paper heart taped inside a cabinet door in one of the cabins that says, Norm and Laney forever with the date of their first date. That's my parents' names, Norm and Elaine. They got married in 1976. My grandpa died the same year, 
five years before I was born. His name was Henry, which is where I got my middle name and my son's name. I have great memories from growing up going to Corny, short for Cornucopia, Wisconsin, with my whole extended family, grandma, aunts, uncles, cousins, swimming, boating, exploring, riding ATVs, campfires, feeding peanuts to chipmunks, but mostly just quality time together as a family. After my grandma went to heaven in 96, things changed. My relatives stopped going up and my parents became the owners. It was different, but I still loved going up. Through high school and college, I brought several friends. Then 16 years ago, I brought a special friend named Emily Berg. The following year, I led her on a scavenger hunt, which ended with a question. Will you make me a rich man? You know, it was based on Proverbs 31.10. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. She said yes. We were married the next summer and have kept up the tradition of summer vacations in Corny ever since. Our kids look forward to going up too. It's a magical place for us. As an adult, I've learned about all the work it takes to keep things going in Corny, especially to open and close the cabins each year. My dad is a super handyman, so he's been the one to maintain them. Over the years, Dad has trained me on how to do all of the routine tasks, but of course, there's always the unexpected too. I've seen him fix enough broken things to pick up on some of that too. I'm telling you all this because last week, I went up to open the cabins for the first time ever without my dad. A couple weeks ago, he started hospice care. He's had a lung disease called pulmonary fibrosis for more than eight years, and it has gotten drastically worse in the last six months, which requires him to be on a constant high flow of oxygen. It was my hope and his that he would be able to make it up to the cabins again. Now, obviously, there are several challenges to making that happen, but I wanted to at least get them open and ready. Thankfully, Everything went relatively smoothly, including my new cell phone service working in the remote woods so I could call and even FaceTime my dad several times a day to ask him questions or just show him what we were doing. At one point, I FaceTimed my dad while riding our jet ski on the lake to give him a virtual ride. The whole time we were up there, I kept thinking about handoffs and change, how my dad had to adjust to going up north after his dad was gone. And again, after his mom passed away, how he must have missed their presence, but how he took the handoff and kept things going. And of course, now how he has equipped me in many ways to take the handoff. When we got back home, I went to return the keys, and he said, no, you keep them. Handoffs can be hard. Have you ever received a handoff? The passing on of a responsibility or task? Being entrusted with something valuable, like a baton in a relay race? Think of a time when you took on something new. How did you feel? Were you ready? Did anyone help you prepare for it? Were you nervous, excited, scared, encouraged, apprehensive, sad? perhaps a combination of emotions. We've all experienced handoffs in life, some bigger and some smaller. Many of them we don't even realize when they occur. Do you remember the first time you were handed a spoon or a fork to feed yourself? Clothes to dress yourself? Toilet paper to, you know, forgive me, I've got young kids at home. You may remember your first day of school, being handed a lunchbox and a backpack, getting on the bus, waving to your parents. Your last day of school, I want to say walking across the stage, diploma in hand, but this class of 2020 graduates didn't get to do that. They got a virtual handoff. 
A word to graduates. We're proud of you and we're praying for you. God bless you on the journey ahead. He is with you. You may remember starting your first job, being entrusted to complete a task and receive a paycheck for it, getting your driver's license, the key to use your parents' car, the key to your own first car. They're all handoffs of sorts. As I was sitting at the table working on this message, my five-year-old daughter, Ida, brought in her breakfast and interrupted me to let me know, Dad, I can make cereal and milk all by myself. Two thumbs up, Ida. She's on her way. Perhaps this pandemic has forced you into a handoff, something new, a change in the way you do your job, or a search for a new one. For the last stretch of the school year, parents received handoffs from teachers to attempt remote learning with their kids at home. Here's some posts to capture how a few parents felt about it. Instructions from the teacher. Just log into Zabblezoot, scroll down to the Zork app, and have the kids work through the assignments sent through the Cracklezam, or check the links post in Drumblekick. The picture shows how some parents feel. Here's another one posted by the untastic Mr. Fitz. Homeschooling day one. Me. I know this is hard. No response from the child. I know this is, it's frustrating. No response. But we'll get through it. Still no response. Now, explain this math to me just once more. I'm very close to understanding it. And one more from Rhonda Rhymes. Been homeschooling a six-year-old and eight-year-old for one hour and 11 minutes. Teachers deserve to make a billion dollars a year or a week. Appreciation for teachers has grown as well as admiration for families who choose to homeschool. As a church, we've utilized technology to, to connect in new ways too. We've had Zoom meetings for kids, youth, for prayer, Bible studies, and small groups. We're using YouTube and Vimeo to post video worship services like this one too. New challenges, new experiences, new handoffs. Why all this talk about handoffs? And what does it have to do with Pentecost and the Holy Spirit? As I was up north last week, I was thinking about Jesus' handoff to his disciples. The ways that he had equipped them and entrusted them to carry on his mission. They had followed the master for three years. They heard him teach. They watched him perform miracles. Welcome the children, eat with sinners, rebuke the religious leaders, go off to pray alone, and ultimately give up his life as a ransom for us and rise again from the dead just as he said he would. After his resurrection, he showed up several times over a 40-day period. Hundreds of people saw him and heard him even touched him. Jesus told them, you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father promised. And in John 16, verse 7, Jesus says, but I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. A handoff is on the way. Last week, Pastor Matt preached about Jesus' ascension. Today, we're looking at Acts chapter 2, an event called Pentecost, which is often considered the birthday of the church. Before we get into what occurred on that Pentecost day, let's try to get into the minds of the disciples at that time. I wonder how it felt to be a disciple then. Think about the memories they had with Jesus, all they had been through, the ups and downs. Jesus had left them once, seemingly for good, when he died on the cross. For a few days, they lost hope and succumbed to hiding. Then, all of a sudden, he's alive and with them again. He was back. It kind of reminds me of when Michael Jordan came out of retirement the first time after attempting to make it as a baseball player. His announcement was two words 
two words that restored hope for Chicago Bulls fans everywhere. I'm back. The Bulls went on to win their second three-peat of NBA championships. Emily and I were watching the Last Dance documentary about Jordan and the 90s Bulls, and she asked me, why do people call him the GOAT? Where did that nickname come from? She didn't realize that GOAT is an acronym for the greatest of all time. Having Michael Jordan back made all the difference for the Bulls. Imagine what having Jesus back meant to the disciples. It was a game changer. We're back on the winning team. Jesus was truly the greatest of all time. For the Bulls, it lasted a few years. Then MJ retired again. For the disciples, only 40 days. Not very long before he ascended into heaven. To be the disciples in that moment, left looking intently up into the sky. He was back, and now he's gone again. How do you think they felt? Sad? Disappointed? Confused? He had just told them, Surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. How is that possible when he just flew off into the clouds? It's possible because of Pentecost. I should say because of what happened and who came on Pentecost. Pentecost was a Jewish holiday, also called the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Harvest. It was celebrated 50 days after Passover to thank the Lord for the blessing of the harvest and to give an offering of the first fruits. It was on this holiday that the Holy Spirit came to fill the believers, an event that had both immediate impact then and implications for us today. See, after Jesus' ascension, the disciples were gathered together in prayer, waiting upon the Lord. They didn't know when or how he would show up. Jesus had told them to wait in Jerusalem, so they did. They all joined together constantly in prayer. We're in a season of waiting, too. There are many uncertainties. There always have been. We're just more aware of them now because of how the coronavirus has affected the world and our lives. Every day, we're faced with the unknown. But we trust in the Lord who knows and holds all things together. We depend on him and have access to him through prayer. Let us turn to God constantly in prayer too. Let us praise him as we wait. He hears us and answers according to his goodwill and perfect timing, even when we don't understand it. On that Pentecost, as they prayed, the Holy Spirit showed up in a mighty way. They heard it, a sound like blowing of a violent wind. They saw it, what seemed to be fire resting on each of them in the form of tongues. They experienced it. The Spirit filled them and gave them supernatural ability to speak in foreign languages. It may sound bizarre to us, but it was in keeping with how God had manifested his presence in the past. Wind and fire were signs of God's movement and God's presence. The significance of their ability to speak in foreign languages is shown in the following verses. We see God's heart for the nations and his plan set in motion to reach all people with the good news about Jesus. Because of the holiday, There were Jews from all over staying in Jerusalem at the time. See, the Lord's timing is strategic. Luke gives us a list of all the places people had come from. Here's a map to show where they were located. You can see that they had converged in Jerusalem from all directions and thus would take the gospel message with them when they returned to their homes after the festival. God's work on Pentecost was a sort of reversal of the Tower of Babel. In Genesis 11, we read that the whole world at that time had one language. In pride, the people desired to make a name for themselves. They began to build a tower to reach to the heavens. But the Lord saw their hearts and confounded their plans by confusing their language and scattering them. But here on Pentecost, we see the opposite. 
God brings scattered people together in Jerusalem and turns their confusion into understanding to unite them as his witnesses back out to the world. If you've ever studied to learn a foreign language, you know that this was an incredible miracle. Here's a picture that my Panamanian students drew of me on our mission trip last summer, along with a card that says, Hello, since it's the last day that we see them, I want to say thank you for always giving me a smile and for the funniest prayers of my life. I hope that I'll see you again one day. I think their English was better than my Spanish. The Holy Spirit helped us understand each other, but it took some work. What happened at Pentecost was special. Just as Jesus brought new meaning to Passover when he shared his last supper with his disciples, that Pentecost brought new meaning to the festival. It is no longer remembered only as an occasion to thank God for first fruits from the wheat harvest, but also the first fruits of a heavenly harvest. Jesus said, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And that is exactly what happened on that Pentecost. The Lord filled his workers with his spirit and sent them out into the fields to reach the people. Before Pentecost, the disciples were certainly convinced of Jesus' resurrection, but they hadn't really engaged in his mission yet. They looked to him to do all the work, but that changed at Pentecost. That day, the disciples picked up the baton. Empowered by the Spirit, they took the hand off and went to work to make disciples. Peter preached a message of conviction and salvation. He didn't hold back. He said, you put Jesus to death, but God raised him from the dead. He said, we're all witnesses of the fact, not the myth, not the rumor, the fact. It was a message for all people. He quoted the prophet Joel saying, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and asked, What shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. The harvest that day was about 3,000 people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And the promise still applies to us today. The same Holy Spirit of Pentecost is here, alive and active. We are witnesses today. We are part of the church that was born on Pentecost. Not a building, but people called by God, brought to faith and empowered to live by the Holy Spirit at work in us. Just because we cannot gather in a building right now doesn't mean we're not the church. The church has literally left the building. We look forward to coming back together again, but now more than ever, we are reminded that the church is not a place. God's church is the people. Jesus is alive. The Holy Spirit is active. We are witnesses of these things. Jesus has entrusted us to continue his mission in the world. Let's take the handoff and run for Christ, faithfully connecting people with Jesus and each other. Amen. Good morning, church family. I just uh, 
began my day today and uh, was thinking about uh, all the time that uh, has been spent away from the church and the time that uh, Pastor Matt and the staff have been working to bring us a a message every week and to stay in uh, touch and contact with everyone uh, from the church. I know that they uh, uh, miss everyone greatly. Uh, It's been a a challenge, and we're hopeful that uh, we'll all be back together uh, soon. So as one of the elders uh, at Lord of Life Church, uh, our responsibility is to look after the pastoral care of the church and to pray for uh, each of you and one another. And myself and the uh, other elders are uh, constantly looking at the uh, prayer requests um, and uh, praying over you. I know Pastor Matt and the staff and prayer team Uh, pray over uh, each and every one of those requests weekly. So I'd encourage you to um, continue to submit prayer requests, continue to uh, ask for prayers. We certainly uh, want you to pray for us as well. So this weekend, as we celebrate uh, Pentecost and uh, the Holy Spirit descending uh, upon the apostle and uh, the disciples, we just want to make uh, sure that we recognize that uh, while we pray and while we're together, uh, even virtually or, or in our homes, that the uh, Holy Spirit is with us. So please bow your heads and uh, join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, come to you this morning uh, recognizing the, the Holy Spirit and that where uh, two or more of us are joined uh, together, that you're there with us. We praise you, Father, and we give you thanks for uh, all of the uh, blessings that you bestow upon us and uh, for the Holy Spirit that dwells among us. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and for the sacrifice that uh, was made uh, for each of us for the forgiveness of sins. We just uh, pray for all of those that are uh, at home, that are struggling, that are dealing with uh, uh, medical issues, whether it's uh, the coronavirus or cancer or other challenges. We just uh, pray for your uh, loving hands and your healing power to come into our lives, to work with uh, each and every one of our family members as they uh, deal with the uh, uh, medical care for their family members and friends. We pray for those that are dealing with mental health and addiction issues. Father, this is a a difficult time for people uh, when they're separated or or alone. We just pray that uh, they uh, are able to get help, to seek help, to find counsel, and that the Holy Spirit works in their lives and that uh, they're able to uh, find the help that they need. Father, we pray for those that are dealing with uh, financial struggles and the challenges of this uh, stay-at-home order. We pray that uh, the government and the businesses and the people that uh, uh, work will find comfort in uh, your word and in your promises that you'll take care of us and that you'll provide for us. We know that uh, you work in mysterious ways and we just pray that all of this is is, uh, for your glory and and for good in our lives, that uh, even though we may feel like we're being tested, that you're there with us and that you're walking with us and that you're taking care of us. I pray for our pastor, Matt, and the uh, church family. I know that it's been uh, a trying time for them, especially want to uh, pray for the worship team and the people that put uh, together this service on Sunday. We just ask that you be with each and uh, every one of the members of our congregation, that uh, they continue to uh, pray and they continue to support the church. We pray for our elders that uh, are busy praying and working uh, through the church. Thank you, Lord, for, uh, again, uh, blessing us financially to be able to weather uh, this type of a pandemic and and virus. We just praise you and give you uh, all the glory. We ask that you go with us this week and that you uh, help us as we make decisions about uh, opening the church and reopening uh, our building to people and uh, Give us the opportunity to uh, serve the community, love on the community, and uh, to give you praise. We pray all of this in uh, Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to join our hearts in prayer using the words Jesus taught us to pray. There came a point when his disciples asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he gave them these words. Would you please join me as we pray the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus also taught us to repent of our sins, to confess our sins to God. The Apostle John, who walked with Jesus, this is what he wrote to the earliest Christians. He said, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. Martin Luther, from the 16th century wrote these words as a prayer of confession, and I'm going to put them on the screen for you now. And we'll join our hearts in a prayer of confession, a prayer of repentance, and then we'll receive the words of forgiveness. Please join me. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. A definition for sin is anything that we think, say, or do that disobeys God. And by this definition, that's every one of us. So God, in his great mercy, had the whole world in mind when he sent to us help from the outside. His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the whole world. God has forgiven you of all of your sins. And he loves you very much. He wants to be with you forever. So he has made peace with you through his only son. Who shed his blood on the cross. And who was raised to life. And now we no longer live for sin. With the resurrection of Jesus and the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. Now you live for obedience, righteousness, justice, and mercy. Because your God has made you alive in Christ Jesus. God has raised you from the dead through the Holy Spirit, who now gives you life to trust in him and walk in his ways. May the Lord of peace reassure you of this promise, that by the grace of Almighty God, your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's now sing to the Lord. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture burst in my sight. Angels descending, bring from the moon. Echo 
Shadows of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long Perfect submission, all is in rest I am the Savior, happy and blessed Watching and waiting, looking above Filled with His good in his love. And this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. And this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day. Throughout Scripture, God sent his people out into the world, giving them a blessing. He knew that they were going out into a world filled with upheaval, chaos, grief, and pain. And he wanted to cover them with his blessing. That they would trust in him. And that he would go with them, in front of them, behind them, and all around them. And the priest would give this blessing to God's people as a covering of protection. To know that they had his favor. So receive this blessing from the Lord. You are his people. And he goes with you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.